I am. Because the the bar didn't come up with the bar. It doesn't show my time anymore for whatever reason. So at least that's why I thought this new one wasn't working, but it is. So anyway, anything from last night you want to take a look at? Otherwise, I'm going to get rolling on sketching some grass. We're going to kind of go through this fairly quickly. Yeah. 15 and 6. Okay, so for 15, okay, 15, the big thing here is you got this negative 3x squared, okay? The negative 3x squared is the most powerful thing, so that's going to lead the way, okay? So one thing that might help is to maybe write it in, in proper order. This one's not in, in, in the proper order, so if we go g of x is equal to negative 3x squared minus 7 halves x. Um, plus 5, this is my leading co leading term, that's my leading coefficient, so then that tells me it's going to do something like this. Okay, sorry, it might help if you could see that. Okay, um, so then we know that it, as x approaches positive infinity, it's f of x is going to get negative, x approaches negative infinity, f of x is going to get negative. So the order, um, the order that they write them in is is important, but just seek out the most powerful. Like if you have a group of friends that you know, guys are like, hey, where are we going to go eat? Well, there might be one person that probably makes the decision more than anybody. I'm just going to take you where they want to go. Okay. Like me. We're going to Mel's. That place is awesome. Sure. And 17 is the same thing. So we got this negative 21, negative 2.1x to the fifth. So then it's gonna go, gonna finish down since it's negative and it's x to the fifth. It's gonna, gonna be opposite. Because that's really the main deal with evens and odds. Evens finish together, odds finish separate. Okay, and they always finish the same as my leading coefficient sign. Okay, so, we're going to move on to zeros of functions. So just having the end behavior is not enough, we need to go ahead and talk about other behaviors of functions. And basically these, these uh, four things are very important for you to understand, okay? Real zero is a polynomial function, a polynomial function is a real number. The following statements are equivalent, it means these all say the same thing. Like x equals 3 is a 0 of the set function f. So 3 is a 0. Okay? x equals 3 is a solution of the equation f of x equals 0. So a lot of these, we're going to be setting it equal to 0, solving it to find a 0, find a root, find the inter x intercept. It all means the same thing. Number 3, x minus a is a factor of the polynomial. So x minus 3 would divide evenly into it. And a four a zero is an x-intercept um, of the graph. So we're going to be using all those ideas today to graph some things. And let's do some things here real quick. I know it sounds like you guys have had a tough last couple hours, class-wise. What was before AP? Chem 2. Chem 2. Okay. So we'll just do a couple basic things and we'll kind of like, we'll turn you loose here a little bit. Okay? So let's just do a couple examples. Say if I said I had x to the third, so I got f of x is equal to x to the third minus 12x squared plus 36x. Our goal is to find all the zeros and then, um, and then, what the heck, we'll probably just go ahead and sketch this as well. So to find the zeros, we need to factor it, set it equal to zero. Those are all the same things. If I was going to factor this, what's the first thing you guys would do? Take out an x. Hey, x, how you doing? Get it, take it out. There you go. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So, so I've got this x. Let's double check it. Yep. So then I've got this x squared minus 12x plus 36 that I can go ahead and factor from there. Okay. And this factor is really kind of nice. X x minus 6 minus 6. So what are my x-intercepts? 6 and 0. Okay. What are my zeros? 6 and 0. Okay. Um, remember, just like the, that last thing said, is a lot of those things are, are asking the same thing. Okay. So what would this look like as far as a graph goes? Well, my x-intercept was 0. Other x-intercept, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's a 0. What's my, what's my end behavior of this function? Touchdown, disco, up, down, what do you got? Disco, up or down? Up. Okay. Okay. So now we need to start talking about something else here. This 6, it occurs twice. So 6, this is what's called a double root. Okay. And the idea of a double root is a very important idea because your, your function ch is different around a double root than it is anywhere. Okay. I'm just going to show you something. Don't worry about writing this down. If I'm going to find out, well, you know, let's say on this one, what do we do? Well, I've got my x-intercepts. If I wanted to graph this function, I would find some other values, right? I might plug in 7, I might plug in 5, I might plug in 4, and just find some other points. In my opinion, this right here is the easiest place to go ahead and plug something in at. Because look at this, if I'm going to plug in 7, look at this. G, we get the answer of 7. So we get the point 7, 7. Okay. And that kind of confirms what I think is my end behavior there. Okay. Now let's plug in 5. 5 times 5 minus 6 times 5 minus 6. 5 times negative 1 times negative 1 gives me 5. So yeah, it looks like it's going up again. So on a double root, it'll either be positive on both sides or negative on both sides. That's a bouncer. It's going to bounce. Double root, bounce. Okay. And then it's going to go up. And then let's, I'm just going to check something here real quick. Let's look around this, um, this situation right here. If I plug in one, I'm going to just do this up here because I think we're getting kind of um, floppy here and there. So if I go 1 times 1 minus 6 times 1 minus 6, do you think, do you see how I think it might be easier to plug it in there? Because otherwise I'm doing 1 cubed minus 12 times 1 squared, you know. Yeah, with 1 it's not a big deal, but with 5 and stuff that's going to get ugly. So I got 1 times negative 5 times negative 5 gives me 10. So, okay, so we're way up here. So what's going to happen is my graph is going way up here and it's going to come back down. And we know what a cubic looks like. Do you think it's going to pass through or do you think it's going to bounce back up? It's going to pass through. Well, if I checked it, it would be negative 1 times negative 1 minus 6 times negative 1 minus 6. I have negative 1 times negative 7 times negative 7 gives me negative 49. So, yeah, it's going to be way the heck down here. Okay? This is a single root. Okay? So it's going to pass through. A single root, it's going to pass through. Double root, it's going to bounce. Okay. So here's what I want to do. Let's do an example of this. A different example. negative 2x to the 4 plus 2x squared. There's f of x. I would like you to go ahead and factor it all the way. Factor it all the way. And then um, 
and then we'll we'll stop and make sure we agree and then we'll talk about the graph what's your first step of factoring it that got a negative 2x squared good Step one of factoring done. Will it factor any further? Yeah. So what are my roots? One, negative one, and zero. What are my solutions if I set it equal to zero? Same thing, one, negative one, and zero. Okay, what are my x-intercepts? Same thing, 1, negative 1, and 0. Are any of these a double root? That occurs twice. Actually, there is a double root. 0, because it's squared. Okay, so I'm going to make a little note there, double root. Now, why? What were you like last time we didn't have a squared? But on the last one, we could have written it as a squared. x minus 6 times x minus 6 is x minus 6 squared. Okay? So now let's, let's graph it. Okay? Negative 2x to the fourth. Disco, touchdown, what do you got? Down or up? Down. Okay, so let's start with our end behavior. Okay? What are my x-intercepts? Negative 1, 1, and 0. Okay? So now as we graph this, we need to know, is it going to pass through these points? Is it going to bounce at these points? What's it going to do? What's it going to do at 1? It's going to pass through. It's a single root. Okay? And we'll talk, we'll get more specific on why that happened a little bit later on. What's it going to do at 0? It's going to bounce. And then what's it going to do at negative 1? Through. There you go. Not as I only use that these values up here to convince you that it bounced at that double root. Travis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'd be tempted to say, you know what? If somebody gives you detention, it's your responsibility to do that. You know? Um, because he spends all of last eight, eight period around reminding people. Just like, you're driving me crazy. That's, and that's one thing that he, because um, he used to be a math teacher, he used to teach a class like this. And, um, and he says he really misses the con the positive contact with the kids. Really, really misses the positive contact with the kids. So it gets doubled. Yeah. And it double, and then uh, and then you get suspended after it got to so many hours. Yep. Yep. Or you do Saturday school. Would be first day like in school suspension or actual suspension? That's a good question. I don't know. I think it, I, that's a, that's a good, very good question. Then it gets back to what is the true motivator of students, okay? Because then you get into what's called positive positive punishment, negative punishment, this, that, and the other. A detention is in a form of positive punishment, okay? Positive means you're adding something, okay? You've added a detention to try and get them to learn that their behavior is not good behavior, okay? 
is me squirting my dog with a bottle of water. That's positive punishment. Why? Because I'm adding a stimulus that wasn't there before. Okay. Um, negative punishment would be taking something away, like taking away your cell phone. That's negative punishment because you're taking something away from the situation. So, um, so but the whole idea, as far as what is really going to truly motivate somebody to change their behavior, um, <laughs> figure that one out. Yeah. Okay. Um, why, I, I guess, why would you think that? Okay, well, well, okay. You personally, why would, or, you know, what, yeah. school property, if you're wasting their time, it's kind of like, I think it's like, you're on their type of property, so you're, you have to go by that kind of... It all goes back, a, a lot of school law is dependent upon, does it distract from the goals of that institution? Does something, anything that, you know, the kind of the general guideline is anything that, dis, that um, keeps that main role, that institution, from occurring, education in this, in this case, um, then you have a lot of latitude, okay? Um, because, you know, there's, there's lots of things that we do in school that might be considered illegal. I'm not going to let you leave for half an hour, okay? Outside of school, if you, you had somebody say, I'm not going to let you leave. Exactly, you know, so... So there's a lot of different things. Like say here, we we can we can say you know hey you can't wear that shirt, where you know outside in the public there's nobody that can tell you not to wear that shirt. Okay, um, so so school law gets very 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 interesting, very interesting. Um, but I, I agree with a damage thing. But but on the other hand, say if um, you know if I was a judge, I'd say you know what maybe if you behave in the classroom, then you could keep possession of your phone. So the responsibility goes back to the owner of the phone. I don't know. Interesting. School law is very interesting. So it would probably be like maybe illegal if you like kept it overnight somewhere. Like if you put it in your desk and said you're not getting this back by the end of the week or something, that probably would maybe be illegal. But Those are all good questions. Those are all very good questions. Like, I say like out of school hours, it's probably mm -hmm. like illegal, but if it's during school hours. Well, it's time. it's one of those things that, that things things get very, very complicated. You know, like you guys have, have been to these things where we're, where we're talking about what's legal on your phones and what's legal not on your phones and having this, having, and what, what's legal to put on Facebook when you're outside of school and what can school act on, what can school not act on. Because just because you do it outside of school at your own home doesn't mean that school can't act on it in some way, shape, or form. So, so the um, the like I said, school law is 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 a challenge, but it's oh, it's yeah. very interesting. Like if someone like that, like if I were to bully that or something, I'll just come She had to pick somebody. Um, and outside of school or whatever, mm -hmm. can't you guys really not do anything? But it goes back to, it, but, but it goes back to this idea: Does that conflict enter the school and disrupt the learning environment of the school? What if you, like, and does it does that impact whether or not Natalia feels safe enough to go ahead and have a quality education when you're in the room? So like the suspension, <laughs> being like the, um, it, it's interesting stuff. I really think it is. Saying, like, if you get an MIP, you can't. You have to sit out for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be more of a on the law thing than a school thing? But if you got caught with like, like the vaping accessories or something in school grounds, that's more school related because you're bringing into that. Yeah, that's true. 
But like, I mean, like the school can act on it, like as when it's out of it's something out of school.